morning. Tonight we continue in our consideration of the subject, Union with Christ. Last week, Pastor Clark began this series by looking at Jeremiah 31, 23 through 40, where we saw the establishment of the covenant. Our union with Christ is rooted in that eternal covenant. Here, God, can, God covenants that he will be our God and we shall be his people. This covenant is made between the Father and Son and with us in union with Christ. In this covenant, the God of heaven and earth lays claim on us as his people. And by this covenant in union with Christ, we lay claim on God. In this covenant, we belong to him, and it is not blasphemous, said Pastor Clark last week, to say that he belongs to us. When God made a covenant way back in Genesis 7, 17, God said to Abraham, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring forever. This morning, Pastor Clark preached from Revelation 21 on heaven. And in Revelation 21, 4, we read these words, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. The message of the scripture from Genesis to Revelation is that God would be our God and that we would be his people. And our identification is based on that eternal covenant. Our identification is based on that covenant which brings us into union with the Lord of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so our text this evening is found in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. That's page uh, 977 in the Pew Bible, if you want to look at it. As we approach this subject, I was thinking, where would be a good place to talk about our union with Christ? The assignment that I was given was to define what this union, what this means, what is union with Christ. And in subsequent weeks, Pastor Clark will be talking about how this union with Christ that we enjoy, that we part, are partakers in, how, these, how this union, the benefits that flow from it to us and the relationship that we have, how we enjoy and understand what is the mystery of this union. The Apostle Peter, when speaking, when writing his epistle, said of Paul's writings that in his epistles, there are some things that are hard to be understood. And so we come then to this subject, something that is hard to be understood, not impossible, not something that, that is, is mysterious in the sense that we can never grasp it and understand that it is revealed to us. But we can begin to understand what is being revealed. So here then, God's holy word, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. 
This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power to me, though I am the very least of all saints. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone, everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose which he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Tonight we want to see this subject of the mystery of union with Christ in three questions. What is the mystery of union with Christ? And we want to see from it that union with Christ is a spiritual reality. Secondly, how is this mystery of union with Christ known to us? Union with Christ is an objective truth revealed in God's holy word. And then thirdly, why should we strive to understand this mystery? And the answer is that our union with Christ is a growing experience. And as we apprehend it, as we understand it, we grow into it more fully. As I said, our text, or at least the starting point tonight, was Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, but because of the nature of, of this subject, uh, it is more like a diving board that will springboard us into the deep pool that is before us. A pool that one might say is bottomless. A pool that, that is unfathomable, that we cannot fully grasp. But yet, it doesn't prevent us from perhaps putting our feet in the water and receiving from it the glorious, refreshing benefits that await. So before we continue, let's ask the Lord to bless this time of study of his word. Father, we come this evening to your word. The subject before us is a great mystery. It is a deep and vast ocean. Yet you have revealed it to us in your holy word. It makes sense that our understanding could never fully encompass our union with Christ. It in many ways must remain a mystery, not a mystery to be solved, but a wonder of your revelation for us to adore you better. Deep is the ocean of your revelation. We cannot fully plumb the depth of it, but we pray that you would grant us, Lord, to meditate on the heavenly mysteries of your wisdom with true progress and piety to your glory and our edification. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I said, mysteries are like an ocean. They're deep. Perhaps we can't touch the bottom. Sometimes they're frightening. And yet, on a hot day, what is more cool and refreshing than to be able to put our feet in the ocean. This, there is a sense in which all of scripture is a mystery, for it comes to us by God's revelation. Without God revealing 
the truth of Scripture, any truth of Scripture to us, it would be a mystery. It would be unknown. What is a mystery? Well, our text this evening, our starting point in Ephesians 3, gives us a working definition of biblical mystery. Mystery is a stewardship of the grace of God, verse 2, which is made known by revelation, verse 3. It is the revealing of things not known in other generations, verse 5, but which is now being revealed by the Spirit through his servants. In this case, in the case of Paul's writing, through the apostles as they were proclaiming this great truth. This great truth that the Gentiles, who at one time were strangers from the covenants of promise, who were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, who had no hope and were without God in the world, Ephesians chapter 2, that they were brought into one body in Christ, that the middle wall of petition between Jew and Gentile was broken down, and that God has made of both one body and that they are united in Christ. The theme of the book of Ephesians we find in this, these words, in Christ. Well, there are many mysteries. They're not utterly unknowable. But I think of, of them this way. Uh, I once had a, a minister tell me that of some things that are revealed in scripture, that they are mysteries like, like the Trinity, uh, the virgin birth, the incarnation, that though we're, they are not utterly unknowable, we know some things of them, for they are revealed in Scripture. Exactly how it all fits together remains a mystery. He said it this way, I'm not sure I understand everything that I believe. I'm not sure I understand, completely comprehend how it is that God who is one is three persons. Not sure I can understand, although I believe that the scripture declares and proclaims of the very nature of God that he is omnipresent, everywhere present. And the psalmist says, if I go to heaven, you're there. If I descend to the uttermost parts of the earth, you're there. There's no place that I can go that God is not there. God is everywhere. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. He knows all. Can we understand, even begin to comprehend how that is possible? No, but we believe it because it is revealed in his word. The incarnation. Can we understand how it is that the eternal God, the second person of the Godhead, left heaven's glory and entered into the womb of the virgin and took on our humanity? Can we understand and fully comprehend how that happened? No. In that sense, it is a mystery. Yet we believe it because it is given to us by revelation of God in Holy Scripture. God hears our prayers. And we understand, we believe that God is a God who answers prayers. But our minds begin to boggle when we think that this God who hears my prayers, and your prayer, and your prayer, and the prayer of everyone who comes to him by faith in Jesus Christ before his throne of grace, at the same time, yet he hears our prayers individually. Oh, my mind boggles when I try to understand, when I try to comprehend how that's possible. To me, that would sound like just some kind of cacophonous noise. Yet our eternal God hears each and every one of us. So then, this then is the nature of mysteries. Things that are revealed to us, but yet we don't fully comprehend how they work together. And the challenge to us then, 
comes from Deuter in Deuteronomy 29, 29, that these mysteries, these secret things, these things that we can't fully comprehend, the secret things belong to God. But the things that are revealed to us are given to us that we might learn to love him more and more and to grow in his knowledge and grace. Other mysteries could be mentioned, but tonight we come to this mystery, union with Christ. This mystery of which Paul writes here is the central theme of the letter to the church at Ephesus. When Pastor Clark and I first started talking about his beginning this, this series, and uh, he asked if I would do this subject to define this, this uh, sermon, rather, to define the subject, union with Christ. We talked about where would be a text to bring it forth from. And we were talking about Ephesians 1 and the glorious truths that are there. And I started thinking about Ephesians 2 and the glorious truths that are there. And, and as I worked my way through the book of Ephesians, I found that really this entire book, the central theme of the entire book of Ephesians is our union with Christ. The mystery of which Paul writes, union with Christ, is the central theme to the letter of the church at Ephesus. Here is the emphasis, here the emphasis is seen in the use of the phrase in Christ as Pastor Will mentioned earlier, in Christ. This fragment of speech, these two words, in Christ, or its equivalent, in him, with Christ, by Christ. This appears in this letter, in the book of Ephesians, 35 times. The phrase in Christ is used to indicate our standing before God. We have been placed in Christ in all his redemptive acts. We were co-crucified and buried with Christ. We can read this in Romans chapter 6, uh, verses 4 through 6, that we are buried with him in baptism, that we were crucified with Christ. We are co-resurrected with Christ, that we are raised again to newness of life. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5, we read that we are raised with Jesus and made to sit in heavenly places. We have been co-seated in the heavens with Christ. The record of this epistle regarding the believer is therefore in contrast to his two positions. First, in Adam, by nature, Ephesians 2, 1 through 7. And secondly, in Christ, by grace, Ephesians 2, 5 through 6. All that we have and all that we are is understood only by the conception that, is it, that it is ours in him. Before Christ, we... Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, we were dead in trespasses and sin, in which we once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is uh, at work in the sons of disobedience. And then the contrast comes, verse 4, but God is rich in mercy. But God is rich in mercy wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, Christ made us alive and has seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians unfolds this theme of our being in him in wonderful detail. The ground of our election, every spiritual blessing, our redemption, our adoption, our forgiveness, our inheritance, is found only in him. 
chapter 1. Our being made alive and being seated in heavenly places, our being brought near and becoming fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, chapter 2, our becoming fellow heirs and members of his body and partakers of the promises, chapter 3, is a spiritual reality by virtue of our union with Christ. It is by virtue of being in Christ that we experience the unity of the church and are enabled and equipped to put on the new self and walk in true righteousness and holiness, chapter 4. It is by the, by the union with Christ that we are enabled to walk in love toward one another, chapter 5. Union with Christ is the pattern for and the power which energizes our family relationships to love our wives as Christ loved the church, chapter 5, and to obey our parents and relate to others, chapter 6, and our union with Christ is what equips us for spiritual warfare. All spiritual blessings are ours in the beloved, chapter 1 and verse 6. So then, what is this mystery of union with Christ. Union with Christ is this spiritual reality. Union with Christ is a subject, as Will said earlier, that, that is very precious, but seems to have been lost sight of for a while uh, in the history of the church, and we really don't have time to go into all the history of the development of the doctrine. but. Back in Calvin's day, uh, he understood this doctrine of, the u- of union with Christ. And Calvin, in writing of this truth, says that this doctrine, quote, is accorded by us the highest degree of importance. Here's what Calvin wrote in the Institutes of Christian Religion. He says, I confess that we are deprived of this, this utter utterly incomparable good. What is that utterly incomparable good? In the context of of what he's writing, it's knowing the blessings which are ours in Christ. I confess that we are deprived of this utterly incomparable good of knowing the blessings which are ours in Christ until Christ is made ours. Therefore, that joining of the head and members, that indwelling of Christ in our hearts, in short, that mystical union, are accorded by us the highest degree of importance so that Christ, having been made ours, makes us sharers with him in the gifts with which he has been endowed. He makes us sharers with him in the gifts. All that is Christ is ours by virtue of our union with him. He goes on to say, we do not therefore contemplate him outside ourselves from afar in order that his righteousness may be imputed to us, but because we put on Christ and are engrafted into his body, in short, because he deigns to make us one with him, for this reason we glory that we have fellowship of righteousness with him. What is union with Christ? The Bible calls God's plan to restore humanity, to redeem sinful mankind, to reconcile enemies to himself, that mystery that has been kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed. Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 26. Yet even as it is disclosed, it remains a mystery. Paul wrote, this mystery is profound when contemplating the union with Christ, the union between Christ and the church. Ephesians chapter five, verse 32. Union with Christ, according to uh, Professor Louis Burkhoff in his Systematic Theology, is that intimate, vital, and spiritual union between Christ and his people. John Murray 
says in Redemption Accomplished and Implied that union with Christ is the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation. A more recent writer, Timothy Majeur, a minister of education at Resurrection PCA in San Diego, California, said it this way, union with Christ represents the sum of our salvation, fellowship, and communion with Jesus, the sum of our salvation, our fellowship, and our communion with Jesus. So what is union with Christ? Well, one early Princeton theologian, A.A. A. Hodge, wrote, the technical designation of this union in theological language is mystical because it so far transcends all analogies of earthly relations in the intimacy of his connection, in its transforming power of his influence, and in the excellence of his consequences. Burkhoff says this union may be defined as that intimate, vital, and spiritual union between Christ and his people in virtue of which he is the source of their life and strength. He is the strength of their blessedness and salvation. That it is a very intimate union appears abundantly from figures that are used in scripture to describe it. It is a union as of the vine and the branches. John chapter 15, verse 5. It is a union pictured for us as a foundation and a building. That, that is being built upon that foundation. First uh, Peter 2. It is a picture, a union pictured for us in Holy Scripture of husband and wife. Ephesians chapter 5, 23 through 32. It is a union that is pictured for us in Scripture as a head and members of the body. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. And Burkhoff goes on to say, and even these figures fail to give full expression to the reality. It is a union that passes understanding. Another defines union with Christ this way. Union with Christ is a phrase used to summarize several different relationships between believers and Christ through which believers receive every benefit of salvation. These relationships include the fact that we are in Christ, that Christ is in us, we are like Christ, and we are with Christ. We are in Christ. Again, the the many passages in the book of Ephesians, in Christ, Uh, other places where it is said that we are in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. Christ lives in us. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. The Apostle Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2 that Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. Christ lives in you. And the Apostle Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27 that Christ is in you the hope of glory. There is this then intimate connection. Burkhoff explains every believer is personally united directly to Christ. Every sinner who is regenerated, is directly connected with Christ and receives his life from him. Our bond is with him. And he gives several passages. Uh, John 14, that as uh, I, the, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I am in my Father. And uh, and I am in my Father, and my Father is in me, and I am in you. John 14, 20. John 15, again, 
the, the uh, vine and the branches. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. Christ dwells in us by faith. Union with Christ is a, an organic union, and union with Christ is a vital union. It is an organic union. Burkhoff says Christ and the believers form one body. The organic character of this union is clearly taught in such passages as John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 19, where we find those words that know you not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells within you and that by that Christ is in us as well. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 and other passages could be pointed out. Uh, chapter 4 and verse 15 and 16. Chapter 5, verse 30. This union, in this organic union, Christ ministers to believers and believers minister to Christ. Every part of the body serves and is served by every other part and together they are subservient to the whole in a union that is indissoluble. It is an organic union. It is a vital union. In this union, Christ is the vitalizing and dominating principle of the whole body of believers. It is none other than the life of Christ that dwells and animates believers, so that to speak with Paul, Christ is formed in them, Galatians 4.19. By it, Christ becomes the formative principle of our lives and leads us in a Godward direction, Romans 8.10, 2 Corinthians 3.5, Galatians 4.19 and 20. How do we come into this experience of union with Christ. Faith is how union becomes operative and powerful in your life. Faith is a God-given gift that allows you to take hold of God's having taken, taken hold of you. If you are in Christ, this is now the defining truth of who you are, that you are in Christ, that your union is with him. This union is mediated Burkhoff says, by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in a special capacity, a part of the mediator's reward, and as such is poured out on the day of Pentecost for the formation of his spiritual body, the spiritual body of Jesus Christ, the church. Through the Holy Spirit, Christ now dwells in believers, and unites them to himself, and knits them together into a holy unit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Galatians chapter 3. It is a union that implies reciprocal action. This, the initial act is that of Christ, who unites believers to himself by regenerating them and thus producing faith in them. On the other hand, the believer also unites himself to Christ by a conscious act of faith and continues the union under the influence of the Holy Spirit by the constant exercise of faith. So then without faith, it is impossible to please God. And Paul says that I live by faith in the Son of God. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, we see the union of Christ expressed in this way, that we become fellow heirs, that we become members of the same body, that we are partakers of the promises in Christ Jesus. Union with Christ, says Rankin Wilborn, 
in his book, Union with Christ, the book which uh, Pastor Clark mentioned last week. He says, union with Christ means that you are in Christ and Christ is in you. Secondly, how is this mystery of union with Christ known to us? Union with Christ is an objective truth. It is realized in Christ, chapter 3, verse 11. This mystery is realized in Christ. Perhaps the illustration could be given of, of a, a young woman uh, who perhaps may have no fortune or title by natural birth, yet she falls in love with and is chosen to be the bride of a wealthy man. And she, becomes, she then comes to possess all of the uh, advantages that are his when her name is changed to his. And she is legally regarded as being in him. Any wealth her husband may have uh, acquired becomes hers by portion, uh, becomes her portion rather, by union of marriage. And so it is in Christ. All the riches of the Godhead dwell bodily in Christ. All blessings in heavenly places are his, and yet in him these things become ours. They are realized in Christ. Well, what does that mean? That means that our being in Christ is, is what makes us and will make us better human beings. Sometimes we use the, the uh, expression, while well, I'm only human, to describe our faults. The revelation of scripture is that in his incarnation, Jesus Christ becomes the true human being. And that all that Christ has as the true human becomes ours in him. Truly human, his glory is our destiny. It's a transforming union then. It is a transforming union. By this union, believers are changed into the image of Christ, says Burkhoff, according to his human nature. What Christ affects in his people is in a sense a replica or a reproduction of what took place with him. Not only objectively, but also in a subjective sense. We suffer, we bear the cross, we are crucified, we die, and we are raised in newness of, Christ, newness of life with Christ, and we share a measure in the experiences of our Lord. And we will, when we are raised again in his likeness, be like him, the true human being, as God created man to be. You recall, and of course we know that God created man, the scripture says, uprightly, but he fell. We were created in righteousness. We were created in true holiness in Adam. And Adam sinned and Adam fell and brought the entire human race with him. And Christ comes to restore the dignity of God's creation. And our being in him assures that in eternity, that that dignity will be restored in us as well. Union with Christ is personal. It speaks of our connectedness to him individually and personally. But it also has bearing uh, on our connectedness to him corporately and of our connectedness to one another. It speaks of our position in Christ. It speaks of our experiential connection. It speaks of our growing up in him, of our sanctification, of our becoming more and more conformed, the Apostle Paul writes, to the image of his likeness, Romans chapter 8. 
It is this union with Christ which causes our desires and our actions to change and causes our us to love the things that Christ loves and to hate the things that Christ hates and to seek more and more to put on Christ. Union with Christ, says Rankin Wilborn, union with Christ is not an idea to be understood, but a new reality to be lived in through faith. And in the weeks ahead, Pastor Clark will begin to open to us how it is that we benefit from and are enabled to live in this glorious privilege of knowing that we are in union with Christ. Why does that matter? Why should we strive then to understand this mystery? Why should we strive to to live out this new reality? Why should that be a concern? James Montgomery Boyce said it this way, apart from Christ, we cannot view our state with anything but dread, but united to him, all is changed, and dread is turned into indescribable peace and joy. There is that excellency, that excellence rather, of the consequences which come to us because of our union with Christ. This indescribable peace and great joy that Dr. Boyce speaks of. Union with Christ, says Rankin uh, Wilburn again. Union with Christ touches on the highest and most profound truths of the gospel and at the same time reaches down into the depth of our human hearts to fill us up with more joy and hope, more comfort and strength than anything else ever could. Is there any truth we need more to lay hold of today than the truth of our union with Christ? Let us strive Rankin Wilburn says in another place, let us strive to understand and experience, taste, and enjoy all we can of this union while remembering that the Christ we experience is always better and more beautiful than our own personal experience of him. And so indeed, it is a mystery. For even as we experience it more and more, even as we grow more and more in grace, even as we are being sanctified and becoming more like the image of his son, we are still afar off. And the Christ whom we serve is always better and more beautiful than our own personal experience of him. Calvin wrote, for my own part, I am overwhelmed by the depth of this mystery. And yet, I am not ashamed to join Paul in acknowledging at once my ignorance and my admiration. Whatever is supernatural is clearly beyond our own comprehension. But let us labor, therefore, to feel Christ living in us, though we do not fully comprehend how it is so. It makes sense that our understanding could never fully encompass our union with Christ. In many ways, it must remain a mystery, not a mystery to be solved, but a wonder of God's revelation, a wonder of God's revelation for us to adore. Deep is the ocean of God's revelation, but the fact that we can't get to the bottom doesn't mean that we shouldn't put our feet in and go for a swim. Calvin says again, in another place I confess, that we are deprived of this utterly incomparable good until Christ is made ours. Union with Christ points us to this utterly incomparable good, the blessing 
of being in him. By our union with Christ, we learn who we are, why we are here, what our end will be, and when our identity, our association, and our objectives are seen and understood in light of the reality of our union with him, that our life is hidden with Christ, that the spirit of Christ the spirit of Christ dwells within us, that Christ is being formed in us. When we understand and begin to comprehend these things, we begin to experience what is already true, that we have union with Christ. And so we sing, and we will sing in closing the words, bless the one whose grace unbounded this amazing banquet founded He, though heavenly, high and holy, deigns to dwell with you most lowly. Our closing hymn this evening is 421, Adorn, soul, adorn yourself with gladness.